Today we will particularly focus on macromolecules. Uh, I mean, they are one of the major biomolecules like polysaccharides, proteins, and nucleic acids. Uh, they are relatively high molecular weight polymers assembled from much simpler precursors of molecular weights uh, much less, about 500 or even below. And the number of polymerized units in uh, different macromolecules um, can vary from tens to even millions. Now, macromolecular synthesis is one of the major energy consuming process within the cells. The macromolecules themselves can further be assembled into a structure called supramolecular complexes, uh, for example, ribosomes, which are uh, uh, composed of like about 70 different proteins and 3 to 4 different RNA molecules. If we analyze the composition of a cell, for example, E. coli, if we take the bacteria E. coli as a representative, we will see that the most uh, predominant or prevalent compound within the cell is water. It uh, takes about 70% of the weight of the cell and the remaining are mostly organic molecules whereas inorganic uh, salts and mineral elements occupy only 1% of the dry weight. Now, among the organic molecules, the majority are the macromolecules like protein occupying 15% and the rest is uh, being occupied by nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, polysaccharides and lipids. Now, proteins are polymers of amino acids and they are the most versatile of all bi biomolecules in terms of structure and function. Some proteins which have catalytic properties can be called enzymes and others serve as structural components, signal receptors, transporters, etc. On the other hand, nucleic acids, that is DNA and RNA, which are polymers of nucleotides, they usually play the role of storage and transmission of genetic information. Now, RNA is uh, particularly interesting because there are some RNA molecules which play both structural as well as catalytic role, particularly in the context of RNA protein complexes. Polysaccharides are polymers of simple sugar molecules such as glucose. They usually play two major roles, first of all energy yielding fuel stores and secondly as extracellular structural elements. Lipids, which are predominantly hydrophobic, greasy or oily hydrocarbon derivatives, they usually serve as structural components of cellular and organelle membranes and more importantly energy rich fuel stores, pigments and intracellular signals. Now, most of these major cellular macromolecules, particularly proteins, nucleotides, uh, nucleic acids and polysaccharides, they are synthesized in condensation reactions and the number of monomeric uh, subunits in the polymer can be enormous. Like proteins, they have molecular weights uh, that may range from about 5000 to uh, more than 1 million. Nucleic acids, the molecular weight can go up to billions. Polysaccharides uh, like starch, uh, the molecular weight can go up to about million or something. Now, individual lipid molecules, they are much smaller. Molecular weight could be uh, 750 to 1500 and are not macromolecules in the true sense. But many uh, lipid molecules, almost millions or so, they can associate with each other uh, non-covalently and form huge uh, structures like cellular and organelle membranes. Now, the structural composition of uh, these different types of macromolecules, say proteins and nucle uh, nucleic acids, they are governed by a fundamental simplicity. The simple monomeric subunits from which these macromolecules are constructed, they are few in number and identical in all forms of life. Uh, say protein or nucleic acid, each of the molecules, they, they are characteristic information rich subunit sequences that they have. And that's why they can be considered as informational macromolecules. For example, uh, let us uh, take a DNA molecule which is usually composed of four subunits A, T, G and C. Now by permutation and combination you can generate almost limitless possible sequences and consequently these type of molecules can store enormous informations. Almost like uh, the musical melodies that can be formed by a very few number of musical notes. Polysaccharides are in contrast. Usually they are composed of only one kind of subunit or maximum two different kinds of subunit. 
for example, uh, cellulose. Cellulose is a polymer of glucose. So you can see that no structural or sequential variation is possible. Consequently, they cannot carry too much information. They can be considered as informational poor, uh, like a monotonous music that can be formed by just one musical note. However, oligosaccharides, uh, which are composed of uh, different sugar molecules, of the number of six or more, which are connected by branched chains, they can show structural and stereochemical variation to carry information specifically recognizable by other molecules and consequently they can act as specific cellular signals. Proteins, they are usually made of 20 different amino acids. They all have uh, one amino group, a carboxyl group, and a hydrogen atom attached to a particular carbon atom called alpha carbon. Now, uh, these alpha amino acids, they differ from each other only in the fourth substituent that is attached to the alpha carbon, which is called the side chain. Like as you can see in this figure, uh, the amino acids, there are six representative amino acids shown. They all have this structure in common. Their side chain is only varying and they can be of various types, alkyl group, uh, alcohol group, uh, carboxylic acid group, a phenol group, a nitrogen base, a sulfide group like that. Nucleic acids like DNA and RNA which are composed of nucleotides, they also have like uh, not that much uh, variation in their components. For example, four deoxyribonucleotides and four uh, ribonucleotides, the components of DNA and RNA respectively, they are all composed on the basis of five nitrogenous organic bases two five carbon sugars and one phosphate. Like for uh, ribonucleotides, the component of RNA, you can have adenine, guanine, cytosine and uracil, but not thymine as a nitrogenous base, which, are, which combined with the ribose sugar and a phosphate group. On the other hand, deoxyribonucleotides, the component of DNA, they consist of adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine, but not uracil which individually combined with the deoxyribose sugar and the phosphate. Lipids are also constructed from relatively few types of compounds. Most lipid molecules contain one or more fatty acids, which are like hydrocarbon chains of varying length attached to a carboxylic acid group at the end. Uh, usually, all of the different fatty acids are de derived from Pymatic acid and oleic acid. Pymatic acid has a saturated chain, oleic acid has uh, one unsaturation. Some lipids may contain uh, alcohol like glycerol and uh, some of them can contain a uh, phosphate group. Uh, starch and cellulose, the most abundant polysaccharides found in nature, they consist of repeating units of glucose. There are many other types of polysaccharides which are composed of different other sugar molecules, but even those sugar molecules are also derived from glucose molecule. So, uh, glucose can be considered as a parent sugar molecule from which all the different polysaccharides are derived. Thus, taken together we can say that only about three dozen organic compounds are the parents of most of the different types of biomolecules. Say amino acids, they can be used to generate proteins, peptide hormones, neurotransmitters, toxic alkaloids, etc. Adenine to nucleic acid, ATP, coenzyme, neurotransmitters, so on. Fatty acids can be used to form membrane lipids. They can act as fuel store and also as signaling molecules. Glucose can be used to prepare polysaccharides as cellulose and starch and different other simple sugars like fructose, mannose, sucrose, lactose, etc. The process of condensation of monomeric subunits to form macromolecules leads to increased order and hence decreased entropy in a population of molecules. With a positive free energy of formation and hence, in both way, contradicts the laws of thermodynamics. Yet cells need these macromolecules, which are less stable and more highly ordered than a mixture of their monomeric components. Now, since these processes are occurring in aqueous medium, the loss in entropy is more than compensated upon the synthesis and folding of the macromolecules by the release of a large number of water molecules that remains non-covalently associated with the monomeric units. And to compensate for the free energy deficit, cells couple 
these polymerization reactions to other reactions that liberate free energy so that the overall free energy change is negative. The usual source of free energy in coupled biological reactions is the hydrolysis of phosphoanhydride bonds such as those found in ATP. So individually this reaction that is amino acids condensing to polymers, the free energy change is positive, it's an endergonic reaction. Hydrolysis of phosphoanhydride bonds, the free energy is negative, there is an exergonic reaction. But when these two reactions are coupled, the sum of the two free energy changes will be negative. So in this way, using these two strategies uh, to compensate for the loss in entropy and loss in free energy, cells synthesize this um, enormously important uh, information-rich macromolecules like proteins and nucleic acids. The molecular organization of cells, they follow a hierarchical structure. That is sort of uh, illustrated in this uh, diagram. See, here we have a cell and we have divided the structure in four levels, okay? So the highest level is the cell or the organelle. Uh, let's take this organelle nucleus. If we go down to level three, the next level, we'll see a supramolecular complex. In this case, chromosome that stays within the nucleus. If we go down to the next level, we will see the macromolecule constituting the supramolecular complex. The chromosome is a complex of DNA and protein. DNA is highly compacted and then complexed with a variety of different number of proteins. So if we take the macromolecule DNA and then go further down to the next level, we will see its components, that is the nucleotides. And we can also go to level zero to split even this monomeric subunit of DNA. A nucleotide can be split into phosphate, sugar, and the uh, nitrogen space. Same for uh, proteins and uh, polysaccharides, which uh, form supramolecular complex, and then we can split it down to the monomeric subunits. Sir, can the property of a particular monomer exert a significant effect on the property of the corresponding macromolecule or the cell itself? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, several typical examples. Um, let us consider a classical example uh, of the sickle cell anemia, which is a hereditary human disorder. Here, uh, the problem lies with the hemoglobin molecule. One glutamic acid residue in one hemoglobin chain is replaced by a valine amino acid, okay, and which is hydrophobic. And because of that, hemoglobin molecules, they form aggregates. And due to the aggregate formation, the uh, erythrocyte itself changes, okay, to a sickle type of shape. Mm -hmm. And because of its shape, the these, uh, these erythrocytes, they become fragile. So, uh, you have a loss in erythrocytes, the RBC count. So, is a, uh, a very nice example where just changing uh, one amino acid, not only changing the property of the macromolecule itself, in this case hemoglobin, but also to the entire cell, in this case erythrocytes. The monomeric subunits uh, of proteins, nucleic acids, and polysaccharides, they are usually joined by covalent bonds. But in supramolecular complexes, however, macromolecules, they associate with each other using non-covalent interactions, okay? These are mostly hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, hydrophobic interactions, and van der Waals interactions. Now, individually, these interactions are weak, but in a supramolecular complex, the total number of uh, these uh, weak non-covalent interactions is quite high. So, in an integrative manner, they exert a significant stabilizing force. Now, the fact of that all biological molecules in all life forms, particularly macromolecules, they are made from the uh, same three dozen subunits or monomeric subunits, it strongly indicate that the modern organism, they are descended from a single primordial cell line and whose fundamental chemistry remains recognizable even to present day. Furthermore, several billion years of adaptive selection have fine-tuned these cellular systems to take maximum advantage of the physicochemical properties of these molecular raw materials to carry out the basic energy transforming and self-replicating processes of a living cell. Now, organic compounds including the basic biomolecules such as amino acids and carbohydrates, they usually occur in only trace amounts in Earth's crust, the sea or the atmosphere. This raises a puzzling question, then how come 
the first living organisms acquired their characteristic organic building blocks. Now, in 1922, the biochemist Alexandre Operin proposed a theory of prebiotic evolution uh, concerning the origin of life early in the history of the earth, postulating that the atmosphere at that time was very different from that of present day. It was a reducing atmosphere, rich in methane, ammonia, and water, and several other molecules, and essentially devoid of oxygen, in contrast to the oxy oxidizing environment that we see today. During that uh, age, electrical energy from, say, lightning discharges or heat energy from volcanic eruptions led these uh, molecules like ammonia, methane, water vapor and some other components of the primitive atmosphere to react and form simple organic compounds. Now, some of these compounds dissolved in the warm ancient seas, which over time became enriched with a large variety of simple organic substances. In this primordial soup, some organic molecules had a greater tendency than the other to associate into larger complexes. Now, over millions of years, these assemblies in turn again assembled with each other to form membrane-like structures and catalysts like enzymes which came together to give rise to the precursor of the cell present at that early time. Now, this hypothesis was tested much later in 1953 by Miller and Urey, who created a, an artificial environment that mimicked the primordial conditions, those primitive environment, the prim atmospheric conditions, and showed that in this condition, uh, some of the biomolecules and different organic compounds could be formed. So, in this apparatus, uh, there is a chamber where this mixture of gases are there, ammonia, methane, hydrogen and water vapor at 80 degrees centigrade. And this uh, mixture is subjected to electrical discharges or sparks and the products after condensing through this condenser are collected in the liquid phase in this chamber. This uh, was collected for uh, one week or more and when this uh, water phase were, was analyzed, it was found that it contained uh, various organic compounds including amino acids, hydroxy acids, aldehydes, and hydrogen cyanide, that is HCN. This established the possibility of abiotic production of biomolecules. Now, later, uh, modern modifications or improvements of Miller's experiments uh, showed the formation of hundreds of different organic compounds, many carboxylic acids, nucleic acids and bases, so many amino acids, sugars, some of them are polymeric sugars, but most importantly, Polymers of nucleotides, that is nucleic acids, or polymers of amino acids, that is proteins or peptides, were found to be formed in these conditions. The self condition products of HCN, they efficiently promoted such polymerization reactions and inorganic metal ions present in the earth's crust like copper ion, nickel ion, zinc ion, etc. They further accelerated the rate of polymerization. The source of energy that drove the formation of these compounds are, include heat, visible and ultraviolet light, X-rays, gamma rays, ultrasound and shock waves, as well as bombardment with alpha and beta particles. Now, short RNA molecules or polymers generated in such ways probably played a critical role in prebiotic evolution because some of the RNA molecules have been found to play dual role of catalysis as well as storage of information. The uh, discovery that some RNA molecules may act as catalysts and uh, catalyze their own formation that is self duplication or self replication gave rise to the idea that it is RNA and not DNA that acted as the first gene and it is RNA and not protein that act, acted as the first catalyst. Okay? This is a so called RNA world hypothesis. So, this idea is uh, kind of schematically described in this figure. As we have discussed that those forces in the primitive atmosphere, they randomly created or organic molecules, some of which were nucleotides. And by chance, some nucleotides polymerized to give short RNA molecules with random sequences. Now, by chance, again, some of these sequences had catalytic properties in the sense that they could catalyze their own replication. So, those molecules, they selectively replicated themselves to generate similar other RNA molecules 
and then their number increased exponentially and the other non-replicating RNA molecules or non-catalytic RNA molecules they sort of diluted away. Now these self-replicating RNA molecules they uh, though they could replicate themselves but the replication was error prone. That means the products the RNA molecule the new RNA molecules they had variation in their sequence they are different from the mother sequence and by chance some of the new sequences they were better catalysts and some of them had even new catalytic property for example some of the newly generated catalytic RNA molecules could catalyze the polymerization of amino acids to peptides okay. now some of these peptides they could form complex with those catalytic RNA molecules so now the RNAs are not alone but in complex with the peptides and now they became better catalysts the RNA protein complexes now is uh, started co-evolution of RNA and protein that they are evolving together then the primitive translation system develops with RNA genome and RNA protein catalysts okay. now eventually these RNA uh, and protein in complex which with each other they are evolving and at certain point of time this genomic RNA had the catalytic property to be copied into DNA okay so now we have a copy of RNA genome to DNA genome at the same time protein peptides are also evolving and suddenly some peptides evolved which had the catalytic property of themselves of their own so now we have a scenario where we have a molecule with dual property that is RNA having uh, the I mean acting as the genome as well as acting as the catalyst we have a piece of DNA or a collection of DNA molecules which can act as genome but not as catalysts on the other hand we have achieved some protein molecules or peptide molecules which cannot act as genome but have catalytic properties okay now uh, RNA DNA protein if we compare them DNA is stabler than RNA but no catalytic property RNA have catalytic property but is unstable protein uh, have catalytic property of course not genomic property but uh, compared to RNA protein is a better catalyst because it's stabler as well as it can show a huge variety in structure and function so DNA as a genome and protein as a catalyst is a better choice than RNA playing the dual role of genome and catalyst consequently a system evolved where we have DNA genome translated on RNA protein complexes that is ribosomes with protein as catalysts but here I must emphasize that uh, catalytic property of RNA is still retained to some extent in cells we have several examples now lipid like uh, components or lipid themselves they played a very critical role in this evolution because in the primordial soup these lipid like molecules formed aggregates and structure enclosing these uh, self replicating catalytic molecules now within that enclosed environment the effective concentration of these molecules increased so the molecular interaction improved and that accelerated the evolution so initially we had uh, uh, and in the primitive stage we had a stage where the synthesis of biomolecules totally depended on chance random but eventually in the evolution of cell we have a system where using the cell's own machinery cell can dictate the synthesis of macromolecules as well as store and transmit genetic information sir what is the oldest evidence of life on earth well earth itself is about 4.5 billion years old now so far the oldest evidence of life uh, goes back uh, to 3.5 billion years in 1980s it was found uh, in a region in australia and some very old rocks the fossils of microorganisms okay so then a little bit older 3.85 billion years old uh, evidence of organic compounds carbon compounds of biological origin was found in Greenland in the 90s so it's like so life is definitely more than uh, 3.5 billion years old
macromolecular properties, the basic macromolecular properties is that they are polymers of simple subunits which are uh, very few in number and uh, they are the same identical or conserved in all forms of life, energy demanding uh, process, the synthesis and the macromolecular assembly from simple uh, monomeric subunits to macromolecules then to supramolecular complexes and then finally to organelles and a complete cell follows this um, structural hierarchical pattern. And we also discussed the um, origin of life, how life began, uh, particularly life uh, in the form of biomolecules, how it began and how uh, the biomolecules or self-replicating biomolecules that we see today, they evolved starting from uh, RNA as a primordial uh, molecule.